Hello, I'm Richard Piacentini, President and CEO of Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this special follow-up session to our 2018 One Health, One Planet Symposium, Chemicals of Concern in the Environment. At our 2018 event, we learned a lot about pervasive toxic chemicals, routes of exposure, and potential impacts, and the actions that the public can take to minimize risk. And today, we're honored to present an extension of that conversation, as two of our speakers, Dr. Shanna Swan and Dr. Tyrone Hayes, share their latest findings on this evolving issue. Phipps is dedicated to investigating the intersection of human and environmental health in all that we do. In 2017, we were inspired by the principles of the International One Health Initiative to establish One Health, One Planet, to build a shared interdisciplinary vision of health and serve as a catalyst for positive change. One Health, One Planet brings together leaders to explore global and local environmental issues and their effects on human, animal, and environmental health. We're honored to host this important discussion as part of our One Health, One Planet efforts. Thank you for being with us here today. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Terry Collins, the Teresa Hines Professor in Green Chemistry and Director of the Institute for Green Science at Carnegie Mellon University. Terry. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, you know, today is a really great day. Uh, today is the publication day of Dr. Shana Swan's book, Countdown. I cannot recommend it enough to all of you. It's a fantastic book. Um, I, I believe this is up there with the two books. I, I, I mean, I read many, many books, obviously, in the connection between chemicals and environmental and human health. And the most epic of these are Silent Spring and Our Stolen Future. Um, I believe that Countdown is in that category. I think Countdown will have an enormous sway in redirecting the chemical enterprise towards a more sustainable future from a present which is utterly unsustainable. So my job today is to, first of all, to welcome you all um, and to let you know that if you have questions that pop up, you can enter these into the chat session and we'll look at the questions. Um, at the end, we'll stay around. Uh, we, we're running at about an hour, but if, you, if you, the questions go on for that and anybody wants to stay around, uh, we'll be here to, to handle that. Um, the way it's going to be structured is we'll first hear from Dr. Hayes, um, and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Swan. And there's a little bit of method in our madness in this arrangement, in that Dr. Hayes is going to talk to us about the impact of chemicals on amphibians um, and impacts that were crystal clearly clear that these were very bad impacts two decades ago or the better part thereof. And Dr. Swan is, is really coming along integrating a huge amount of data, including the amphibian data, to tell us about ourselves and the impact um, of everyday, everywhere chemicals on ourselves. Um, so let me begin by introducing Dr. Hayes and then um, he will uh, lead with his, uh, he will follow on with his talk and, but we won't have questions at the end of that. I'll then introduce uh, uh, Dr. Swan and we'll hear her talk. So Dr. Tyrone Hayes is a world famous professor of integrative biology at the University of California at Berkeley. He was born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina, where he developed his love for biology. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University in 1989 and his PhD from the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley in 1993. He was postdoctoral trainee at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development uh, and the National Institutes of Health and Cancer Research Labs uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, but 
uh, interestingly funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, uh, everybody has been supporting Tyrone. <laughs> uh, but this training was truncated when he when he when he was uh, I mean what happened is uh, the Berkeley faculty recognized extraordinary talent and they hired him as an assistant professor in 1994 uh, shortly after that uh, postdoctoral effort had started he's rapidly promoted and today he's the chair or about to become the chair um, of the Department of Integrative Biology so for the last 20 years, Dr. Hayes has focused on the role of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Remember that term, endocrine disrupting chemicals. This term, these chemicals are the biggest things to ever hit chemistry. And you're going to see part of the logic of that today. Endocrine disrupting chemicals as environmental contaminants, particularly pesticides. He's one of our greatest world leaders and helping us to understand the role of endocrine disrupting pesticides in global amphibian declines, frogs, basically frogs and other amphibians, and a premier thinker on the environmental justice concerns associated with targeted exposures of racial and ethnic minorities to endocrine disrupting chemicals and the consequent healthcare disparities. So I've been very lucky for nearly two decades I've known uh, Dr. Hayes, I've been inspired by him, by his work, by his extraordinary courage and gladi gladiatorial dexterity, actually, in handling professional and personal attacks by a chemical corporation, which I consider to have been utterly despicable. Trying to protect an unsustainable pesticide from the consequences of Dr. Hayes's findings that it's a potent endocrine disruptor towards amphibians. Dr. Hay Hayes's amphibian reproductive findings have been dead canaries in the coal mines for the human reproductive effects that Dr. Swan will speak about later. So without more ado, Tyrone, Dr. Hayes, uh, it's over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, let me just share screen and You're seeing my, so as Dr. Collins just described, I'm gonna to talk to you primarily about the role of atrazine in amphibians and their potential role in amphibian decline, but I'll also talk about <clears throat> the implications for um, other wildlife and humans. And um, I'll talk very, very briefly about the EPA's response to my work and the work of others. So I, I've, I've for years now referred to this talk as from Silent Spring to Silent Night, a Tale of Toads and Men. And the title <clears throat> is in reference to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which is just mentioned, and the warning that the death of birds and the role of pesticides in those deaths were a warning to humans. Um, as you, many of you may know, 80% of all amphibians are in decline and, and threatened with possible extinction. And I believe that the role of pesticides is fairly big in that decline. And, and thus, our silent night, I believe, our new carry canary in the coal mine is a warning to us as well. Um, a, a, tale, a Tale of Toads and Men reflects the fact that um, I think that the problems that we're seeing in amphibians are also reflected, as you'll hear from Shana Swan, in problems associated with humans. So before I start, as a matter of um, disclosure, I want to point out that I've been funded by lots of agencies, federal and private and nonprofit, but I also as a matter of disclosure, I have been funded by Novartis Syngenta the company that produced atrazine, and in fact, that contracted me to start the studies in the first place. If you're not familiar with atrazine, here it is. It's an S-chlorotriazine. Uh, it's an herbicide or weed killer that's been used since 1958, primarily used on corn in the US. And we use still about 80 million pounds annually in the United States. At the time that I started working on it 20 years ago, it was the number one and is now the number two selling pesticide in the world. And it's used in more than, than 80 countries and now outlawed, interestingly, by the European Union. So the company is that which is based in Europe is, is based in a place where atrazine is not allowed to be used. I studied the African clawed frog, Xenopus lavis, and its response to atrazine actually at the request of the company initially. And this is going back about 20 years. I'm gonna tell you about published data and, and new data that we're working with now. 
But we show that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box of the larynx and exposed male frogs. And it also caused the development of hermaphroditism or intersex as some people refer, where individual, and we now know genetic males, will not only develop testes, but multiple ovaries and testes um, in some of the exposed animals in, in our populations. We hypothesized and later showed evidence that the reason for this, the mechanism behind these effects are the following. Typically the testes should make testosterone, the so-called male hormone. In fact, the word testosterone is a portmanteau, it means testicular hormone. It's two words stuck together. And our hypothesis was that atrazine turns on the enzyme aromatase that converts testosterone into estrogen. The results are that you're demasculinized and you, you lose your male features, such as your, your larynx doesn't grow. And you're also subsequently feminized because you now start making, quote, the female hormone um, when you shouldn't. So we later, and again, that was published almost 20 years ago now. But we, in a later study, we asked, well, what happens when these animals become adults, because we show these effects at metamorphosis. So after a two week, or sorry, two month exposure as larvae, we grew these animals up for eight years. And, and we found out that a portion of the exposed animals completely turn into females when they reach adulthood. So for example, we can use PCR to determine whether or not an animal is genetically female. So females have a gene here. I hope you can see my arrow that males don't have. and Males only have, males and females have this gene called DMRT1. And, and so what you're looking at here are two animals, that's a male, and, and they're doing exactly what you might think that they're doing. And, oops, and what you can also see is that the animal that it's copulating with is genetically also a male, but in fact, internally, that genetic male that was exposed to atrazine is a female. It's a genetic male that develops ovaries. And in fact, what's really exciting for me now, you see these eggs that are laid here? We are now submitting a paper on the great, great grandchildren of animals that grew from those eggs. So we now have eight generations of data that I won't have time to talk about today. The next question that we asked in the same study is, what happens to the 90% of the exposed males that don't grow ovaries? So we examined genetic males that were exposed to atrazine that had testes and we did it, we did these studies in, in what I call the pool party experiment. And in, and in these experiments, we simply added control females or unexposed females. And then we allowed control males and control and atrazine treated males to compete for these females. And this was the first step to determine whether or not these animals had the capacity to reproduce, i.e. do they even show reproductive behavior. And, and, and we did that really simply by we put them in the pool, we let them stay overnight. And then the next morning, you see there's stitches here for us to identify which animals, which we just calculated whether or not the atrazine treated males could compete for the control males for access to the females. And we found out that in fact, atrazine treated female, or males almost never get the female. So they're unable to compete with the control males. What's more as we measured testosterone levels, again, the so-called male reproductive hormone. And on average, and we already knew this, on average, atrazine-treated males have significantly lower testosterone levels compared to controls. And if you look at the individuals that were successful, shown by the hearts, what we find is that there's almost a testosterone cutoff, so to speak, that the males that don't have enough testosterone either are unattractive to the females or they simply get beat up by the other males, but they, but they don't have access to the females in those competitive experiments, with the exception of the two successful atrazine treated males. In other words, they don't have enough testosterone to show reproductive behavior. We also tested fertility in this same study, and we did that by isolating pairs and allowing them to copulate, and then simply counting the number of unfertilized eggs, shown here in the top left, compared to the number of fertilized eggs. And when you do that, you find out that the atrazine treated males so genetic males that were exposed to atrazine that do have testes have very low fertility, around 15% of the eggs are fertilized compared to 85% in control. And that lack of fertility, the, the, the decreased fertility of eggs is due to one, they don't show the behavior. So, they, so, they, so even when they're isolated, they don't copulate with the females, they just watch the females lay eggs. But on top of that, if you examine their testes shown here, this is control and, and atrazine treated, 
test is compared under the microscope. So these are thin slices. If you blow that up, what you find is not only do the control males not have enough testosterone to show behavior, or sorry, not only do the atrazine treated males not have enough testosterone to show behavior, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm production. So these are sperm in the controlled testicular tubules. And you can see the testicular tubules of the atrazine treated animals have cellular debris. Most of the testicular tubules are devoid of sperm. So the next, and, and these are now unpublished data. So the next study was actually sort of by accident. I had an undergraduate who was taking care of the animals. They were all housed in large tubs, all genetic males, controls separated from atrazine treated males. And I'm only gonna show you one piece of the data. She, she would come up after cleaning the tanks and I would say, what takes you so long? And she would say, well, I have to pull them apart. And I said, what do you mean you have to pull them apart? She goes, yeah, I have to pull them apart. And she didn't know, but I knew the tanks were all male. So these are two genetic males exposed to atrazine. They have testes. Sometimes you get things like this. And I'd never seen anything like this before. So it turns out that the reason that the atrazine treated males, one of the reasons that they can't outcompete the control males for ac access to females is that they're not really interested. They're more interested in, in, in mating with other males. And in fact, uh, one of the first things we explored was, you know, maybe this is some kind of crowding effect. There are only males in the tank. Maybe it's big males overpowering smaller males. And in fact, that's just the opposite. If you look to pair it up, the ones on the bottom are always larger, which is interesting because normally the females are larger in this species. What's more is the ones on the bottom typically have lower testosterone than the ones that are on the top. And the ones on the top, which are performing as the male, have non-detectable estrogen. But the ones on the bottom, which are showing the female typical behavior, have estrogen levels that are in the range that you would normally see in a female. So I realize that's sort of a loaded language. Sean and I had this discussion earlier, but I think we're not only seeing an orientation issue, i.e. some of these animals prefer to mate with other males, but we're also seeing an identity issue. If you, if you assume that the identity, whether or not you're male or female as a frog is whether or not you're on the top or the bottom, these animals that preferentially mate with other males are always on the bottom. They, they, they never switch. Um, uh, positions. So I believe they're also identifying, if you will, as, as female, and they also are showing an orientation towards other males. The exciting thing that we're doing now is we're asking some, asking some questions about variability and sensitivity. Because remember, I told you these pairs of males that we have, the ones in the top and the ones on the bottom, were both exposed to atrazine. Okay. What we're finding is that, that, there's, a, they, that there's a gradient of effect. So if we can, if we will, go along the spectrum from completely male to completely female, what we find with animals that are resistant to atrazine is they have high testosterone level. They have a clo cloaca, like the one you see here. That's, that's typically a male type cloaca. I'll show you what a female looks like in a, in a second. Um, they have these breeding glands, which are these testosterone dependent glands that are associated with breeding activity on their arms. They have a large larynx with a muscle that goes all the way around what's called a thiohyro. So that's a male typical larynx. They have sperm in their testes and they tend to mate with females and they're always in the top position. Some animals are slightly demasculized by atrazine. They have decreased testosterone levels. They have a cloaca or a, a, a bum, if you will, that looks slightly feminine. They have reduced breeding glands. They have a reduced or, or a laryngeal morphology that's more typical of a female, even though it's still large in size. And they tend to have no sperm in the testes and they don't breed with anybody. Their behavior is asexual. Then you have animals that are partially feminized. They have low estrogen levels. They have a cloaca that almost looks like it has an ovipositor for laying eggs. They completely lack breeding glands. And some of them have large oviducts, even though what you see here, those are testes. And these are the oviducts. So this is the equivalent of a, of a man with a uterus. And these animals tend to reproduce as females. They prefer males and they prefer the bottom position. Other animals like the 10% I told you about are completely feminized. They have high estrogen levels. They have a cloaca that's modified for laying eggs. 
They lack breeding glands. They have a small female typical larynx and they have large ovaries that produce eggs. And, and they in fact function as females. They not only copulate, but they lay eggs and they're completely feminized. So there's, so there's variation and you can get this whole spectrum out of one tub of animals that are exposed to atrazine. So there's variability and sensitivity in the same way that there's variability in, in terms of the different parts, in terms of what gets demasculized and what gets feminized. Remember too, that the gonad varies in its sensitivity. So this is an atrazine treated animal that developed as a hermaphrodite, but the whole gonad didn't turn into an ovary. It retained some parts of the gonad as testis, so it didn't respond to estrogen, estrogen or atrazine, whereas other parts are completely feminized. What's more is, and this is really exciting, there's also variation between populations. So we have, so what you're looking at here, these are genetic males, all of these experiments exposed to the same dose of estrogen, three parts per billion estrogen. The red or the blue are the animals that develop testes only. The red are animals that develop ovaries only and the yellow are animals that develop testes and ovaries. You can get almost any answer you want, depending on which population or which family line that you pick. Some animals are completely resistant. So this population was exposed to estrogen and almost none of them grew ovaries. Whereas other populations you're exposed to the same dose of estrogen and you get complete feminization of every individual. What's more is we've shown that the sensitivity can be selected for and it can change depending on which generation and how many generations have been exposed. And the other thing that's interesting is that all of the sensitive lines that we have in my laboratory come from field or wild sources, whereas all of the commercial sources tend to be on the resistant side of the spectrum. So one of the things that my lab is really interested in is what are the molecular mechanisms that underlie this variation in, in sensitivity to estrogen? One of the other things that we've done is we've tried to assess the sensitivity in the wild or assess the effects of atrazine in the wild. And you can imagine that's gonna be very difficult. We published one study, a small study, showing that we could show a correlation between <laughs> atrazine contamination and hermaphrodites or feminized animals in the wild. But imagine now all these red dots are places that we've collected all over the United States. Imagine now not only the atrazine levels vary at all of these spots, so they're exposed to different levels, but very likely the sensitivity of each population and even of families within a population will vary at each of these spots as well. The next question that we're trying to ask, and this will, this will lead into work that Dr. Swan talked about, that Dr. Swan will talk about, is this is a problem just with frogs. And I like to use this slide <clears throat> from Uganda and Lake Nabugabu where the runoff from this crop, which goes in these containers as the drinking and cooking water for this village. I like to use this to show the oneness of environmental health and public health. Because if I could tell the people in this village that you know, the, what's running off of your crops and into your water here is affecting the frogs and the fish in this water, then the connection between how this might also affect their own health would be very clear. That's a little more difficult to explain from somebody from my village. So this is Oakland. I live somewhere here. And we make these assumptions that the Environmental Protection Agency and that these agencies um, provide protection and we wouldn't have to worry about such things in our drinking water. Well, all you have to do is ask somebody from Flint, Michigan and you'll know that that's not the case. But in fact, atrazine is the number one contaminant of drinking water in the United States and in the world for that matter. We've gotten a, a unique opportunity to to try to study the impact of atrazine on wildlife and to try to address its impact in humans. Ironically, Congaree National Park, this is where I grew up in South Carolina as a kid. This is where, you know, I like to describe myself as a little boy who likes frogs. This is where I fell in love with frogs. And, and now as a national park, um, I like the joke that I took the hood to Harvard, now I can get my chance to bring Harvard back to the hood. Because it, see, it turns out that Congaree National Park is contaminated as discussed in this newspaper article a few years back, contaminated with, guess what? Atrazine and ethanol estradiol. The article was all about, you know, what about the weekend people who come to, you know, kayak through the park, what if they fall in the water? But my concern is, what about the 30 species of frogs and other animals that the park was put there to protect in the first place? And what about the low income black community that live around the park and it's their leaky septic tanks with the ethanol estradiol from birth control pills that are contaminating the park. What about the people who live there 
and are exposed all the time. The concern is real because the mechanism by which atrazine um, causes es excess estrogen production is relevant to all vertebrate animals. So this is, I won't bore you with the whole map, but atrazine blocks an enzyme called phosphodiesterase and that ultimately leads to upregulation of aromatase. And it, and it uh, functions this way in fish all the way up to humans. So there is a concern. I published a paper with 22 co-authors and I see that at least one of them's on the call today with 22 co-authors from 12 different countries. And we showed that it's, atrazine doesn't just decrease sperm in the testes of frogs, like I showed you, but a colleague showed that the same thing happens in fish. This is a guy from Belgium. The same thing happens in caiman. This is a reptile, like a big alligator. This is work from Argentina. The same thing happens in rats. This work was done in Croatia and in uh, Nigeria. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. And I have a colleague in Pakistan showed the same thing in birds and quail. If you look at testosterone levels and whether or not a decline in testosterone is, is the reason that the sperm is declining. It's been shown in fish. This is from work that was done in England. It's been shown in my frogs, which I've already shown you, and it's been shown in rats. And again, I said, I study frogs because I'm a little boy who likes frogs. I'm pretty sure that people don't study rats because they're little boys and girls who like rats. I'm pretty <laughs> sure they're studying rats because they're mammals and tell us something about humans. My colleague, Shauna Swan, that you'll hear from, also showed that men in Columbia, Missouri, who have low sperm count, low semen quality, and trouble getting their wives pregnant, that there's a correlation between atrazine in the urine and, and this decreased fertility. And what I did tell you is 0.1 parts per billion, which is what these men have in their urine, is the same dose that we use to chemically castrate frogs and fish, frogs and fish. So go figure, if you have enough atrazine in your urine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish, you also yourself have a low sperm count. This is a study from another colleague showing that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have um, babies with birth defects. And, and there are several types of birth defects. I'll focus on one study that showed that if you're exposed to atrazine in utero, and if, if you are carrying a son, then they observe modest but consistent associations between medium low and or medium levels of, I can't read what that says because it's off my screen. Um, basically they showed that atrazine exposure was associated with three conditions. And sorry, and those three conditions I'll show here, show you here, and and just as a warning, there are. Sorry, uh, please and, please finish, uh, Tyron. Don't don't worry. Okay, right. Just as a warning, I, there's some graphic images here. Um, atrazine is associated with hypospadias, where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. Atrazine is associated with cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. And atrazine is associated with micropenis, where the phallus doesn't grow. So that's just a correlation showing that prenatal exposure or exposure in utero yeast leads to these um, genital malformations. And remember that male genital development depends on testosterone. And if you're exposed to a chemical that decreases testosterone, you have a male child that looks as if it didn't have enough testosterone or that it was exposed to too much estrogen. Again, that's just a correlation, but this paper, which just came out, in, in 2020 examined mice and found that mice that were exposed to atrazine experimentally developed hypospadias, as you can see here. Those mice also developed cryptorchidism where the testicles didn't descend into the scrotum and, and that's shown here. And they also developed microphallus associated with a decrease in testosterone as shown here. So the same kind of correlative, same kind of experimental effect we see in other animals that are correlated with similar effects in humans and can be reproduced experimentally in mice. So I think that my interest in this aquatic organism is telling us quite a bit about this, this aquatic organism. I would argue that one of my frogs in a contaminated pool or a contaminated aquaria is no different than a fetus developing in a contaminated amniotic fluid. And we now know that humans will be your children will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. Now, what does the EPA say about this? Well, the EPA said a few years ago about Syngenta, the manufacturer of, of atrazine, they commented, 
that it is unfortunate but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's conception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. So this is what they said about Syngenta, the organization that's supposed to be uh, regulating them. In 2020, you can see here, the EPA released a draft biological evaluation for atrazine where they concluded, most importantly, that atrazine is likely to adversely affect 54% of all species and 40% of critical habitats. After 20 years of studies, they finally admitted this. So what are they doing about it? Well, this is also from 220, US EPA reapproves atrazine. And the reason is, as they said to New Yorker Magazine a few years back in an article about me and my work, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. So they're saying it affects 54% of all species and 40% of all critical habitat, but somebody makes money on it. I'll stop there. And thank you, sorry again for the alarm going off. <laughs> uh, not at all, Tyron. Th thank you as always for a complete, completely brilliant presentation. And again, let me tell the audience if you have questions for Tyrone, just put them in the chat box um, and we'll uh, get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thanks again, Tyrone, that was amazing. Now we're gonna move on to our next and final uh, speak speaker, uh, Shana Swan. So Dr. Shana Swan is a world famous professor of environmental medicine and public health at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. I've known Shana well for nearly two decades and come to regard her as exceptionally cautious in interpreting scientific and epidemiological data. Shana is exceptionally cautious. She is an international treasure house of insight into the effects of, on male reproductive health of industrial chemicals in the products of virtually every activity and space in our chemically dependent world. Dr. Swan's work gives us the most powerful insight ever into what are devastating trends in Western human sperm counts and quality, where every day, everywhere, that's what I call them, chemicals are clearly playing a leading role. Her scholarship ranges widely over the chemical human interface and she is also one of our greatest interpreters of chemical effects on the reproductive health as woman, of women, as well as on the neurodevelopment of children. And you'll realize this easily from her talk today. Dr. Swan's published over 200 scientific papers. She's been featured in many TV interviews and there's gonna be many, many more and written up in a variety of leading magazines and newspapers. So now we'll hear from her about what she's learned and what we all need to know about chemicals and the future reproductive capacity of our race. And as you listen to Shana, I want you to really be thinking about one thing. What on God's earth are we going to do about this uh, impeccable science? How are we going to respond? How are we going to change the chemical enterprise so that the effects that you're about to learn about, you've already learned about some, are not uh, effects into the future. Uh, thank you very much, and Shana, we look forward to hearing from you now. Okay. So, Terry, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to Phipps for bringing me back for a second time. I had such a good time last time, uh, and I'm so happy to be here again. And Tyrone, thank you for setting me up so well. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, amazing to have our two talks together, and we're going to have to do that more often because they you'll see they really go together. Um, OK, so let's get started. For some reason, it's not forwarding. Oh, gosh, there we are. OK. Um, so I, here's a roadmap for what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the problem, which is the 
challenge to reproductive health that the planet is facing today. I'm going to talk about some of its causes, some of which you've already heard about, the consequences, and some possible solutions. So let's start with the problem. So let's go back to 1992, um, when I first learned about the problem that I'm going to be talking about. There was a paper that was published out of the University of Copenhagen by Elizabeth Carlson and colleagues, in which they stated that there's been a genuine decline in semen quality over the past 50 years. This was um, a very broad statement and it drew a lot of um, criticism and many people were skeptical about this, as was I. Terry mentioned that I'm cautious and when I first saw this, I, I thought perhaps that trend that they reported was actually due to what we call biases and confounders, artifacts that could produce a trend which was not real. So if you think about some of the things that could do that, um, sort of brainstorm this together, think about what would make sperm count look like it's going down, but it's not really going down, right? So, um, well, maybe we counted sperm differently in recent years in a way that counted lower. So changes in method. Maybe the men that were recruited in later years had poorer sperm. They just came from a different population. Maybe the men themselves had been affected in ways that might be different in earlier and later times, such as more obese men in later years or men who smoked more in later years, things that can affect sperm count. So I decided that I would look at these data and see if I could make the trend go away, okay? And that's what epidemiologists like to do. And so I got the 61 studies that are underlying this paper and I looked for all those factors I could find that might have explained the trend, okay? And then I did a reanalysis of all the studies with all of those factors, and it did not change the slope of this curve at all. I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. And I published that in 1997. And at that point, I was much less skeptical. Um, I did some other analyses, which strengthened the findings in my opinion. And finally I said, okay, I'm going to have to examine what environment is doing to sperm. In other words, is sperm count different in different areas if we replicate the identical study in four places with different environments? And I did that. And one of the places we chose was rural Missouri where I happen to be living where they grow corn and use a lot of, guess what, atrazine. And one of the places was Minneapolis where, well, that's a city and they don't have a lot of atrazine there. So um, I compared the semen quality between Minneapolis and Missouri, as I did to New York and Los Angeles also, but I'm gonna focus on these two. And men in rural Missouri had half the number of moving sperm as men in Minneapolis. In the exact same study replicated in those two cities. So something was going on there. And then we got a sample of men with terrible sperm count. All of their morphology, motility count was very abnormal. And then we got a sample of men, all of whom had very good sperm motility and morphology. And then we compared the amount of pesticide in the urine of those men. And we found that in the men with poor semen quality, there was significantly more atrazine and alachlor and diazinon than in the men who had good semen quality. And by the way, in, in um, Minneapolis, it didn't matter. We couldn't find any pesticide. So it, this is a story about Missouri. And it's about men with good and bad semen quality in Missouri. Okay. so. I was hooked on this. I, I was convinced that environment mattered for sperm count, that sperm count had declined. And fast forward now to about 2014 when I was talking to a colleague and he was saying, you know, that 92 paper of Carlson, it's been almost, you know, it's been 22 years. Shouldn't we update that? And so we decided 
to begin a reanalysis, a meta-analysis this time, much more sophisticated methodology, much larger study, and this is what we found. So this is the taken from a graph that was published in our paper from 2017. In the published paper, the data go from 1973 to 2011 collection time. Publication went to 2014. And what we found was that there had been, in those 40 years, a 52.4% decline in sperm concentration. This was very, very similar to the slope that Carlson had presented. So it looked like the story had not gotten better. And then we also went in here and said, well, what happens if we just look at the past 20 years, the past 10 years? Do we see it tapering off? Do we see it leveling off, as you see in these curves to the right? And we didn't see that. The only way we can make this level off, slow down, improve is by taking the actions I'm going to describe to you. It's not just a story about sperm count. And this is something that you can see from Tyrone's work. Um, and um, you can see it in my book, Countdown, which is out today, as Terry mentioned. Um, sperm count is certainly very important, but there are other markers in males and females which tell us that things are going down at about the same rate, which is so amazing. So miscarriage rate has been increasing at 1% per year. Sperm count has been going down about 1% per year. So have genital birth defects been going up, testosterone going down, infertility worldwide going down, okay? So we're looking at a crisis in reproductive health which is marching at a common beat in all these areas. Um, and I think this is a crisis that we have to address immediately. So what are some causes? Before we can find solutions, we have to find causes. And you've heard about one really important cause, a pesticide, atrazine. I'm gonna to talk to you about some other causes. But before I do that, let me just lay out the possible categories of causes, okay? So if you look at all possible causes, we like to break those out into genetic and environmental. That's a little crude because of course, environment can, we now know, affect how genetics are read out. But basically, <laughs> genetics alone will not explain this decline. It's much too fast. So we're left with environment. So environment is a big category, and I'm gonna break it into two, chemicals and lifestyle factors. And I'll give you some examples of both of those. Under chemicals, I'd like to break it down further into the endocrine disrupting chemicals that Tyrone talked about and other chemicals. And I'm going to focus as Tyrone did on endocrine disrupting chemicals. So here are some examples. These are names may or may not be familiar to you. Um, phthalates make plastic soft and flexible. They're also in cosmetics. They retain scent, they retain color. Um, they're in pesticides too, because they help the pesticide go up the plant. Um, they increase absorption of whatever they're in. The phenols, best known bisphenol A, but there are others. They make plastic hard, the kind of the flip of that. Um, they're in tin cans. They're um, in receipts, they're in our bodies, water bottles, baby bottles. I'm sure you've heard about bisphenol A. The PFOS are chemicals that are now very hot <laughs> in the uh, academic field. Um, they're sort of more recently studied. The others have been studied for a longer time. But for example, think Teflon. Um, so um, the anything that um, is water protective or grease protective will, will be PFOS pesticides you've heard a lot about. And then there are flame retardants, which have a terrible history um, and are really um, dangerous. But today I'm going to focus on phthalates. So just to give you an example, there's the Teflon. There are some rubber duckies. They're containing phthalates. There's, there's the 
pillows. They're containing flame retardants. There's the pesticide, the crop sprayer. There's the tin cans with bisphenol A, nail polish with phthalates and other chemicals. And by the way, this is not one at a time. There's a lot of overlap in these. We're exposed to all of them. And many of these products contain multiple endocrine disrupting chemicals. So now this story that I'm going to tell you is going to be very familiar because it, it shares a lot with what Tyrone was telling you. Um, so let's think about, this is just a schematic, think about the undifferentiated sex organs, which is what's going on in very early pregnancy. Think maybe week six, seven of gestation. The fetal testes then produce testosterone in the genetic male. The female has it also, but very low, but the genetic male has it at quite high quantities in early pregnancy. And it's because of that surge in testosterone that happens in early pregnancy that his genitals develop in the male typical way if he's a genetic male. If the testosterone is not seen there, or if it is genetic female, then the, ge then the genital tract will be female typical. Okay, so that's a very crude schematic of the picture that I'm going to talk to you about. So clearly the male needs testosterone. What can interfere with testosterone? Well, guess what? Phthalates. Phthalates, particularly three bad actors, are androgen antagonists. They're antiandrogens, that is, they lower testosterone. And here's shown nail polish, shower curtain. And the last one is not so obvious maybe, but that's a milking machine. And it turns out whenever food goes through soft plastic, the phthalates in the soft plastic leave the plastic and enter the food or the milk in this case, and then go into our bodies and into the fetus and the damage is then done. What damage is that? Well, look here, here on the left, is a graph of a mouse's testosterone, and that mouse is not exposed to a phthalate, okay? And we see a surge in testosterone, and that's the needed surge to develop the male in the genetic male typical way. But when the mom is exposed here to diethyl hexyl phthalate, that exposure suppresses the testosterone surge, and he doesn't see it. So, Parenthetically, let me say that the female is not affected. She has very low levels and this is not a female story. So you can imagine that this is a bad thing to happen during pregnancy. And this is what it does for mice and rats. And this was shown in 2005. This was so striking that the researchers named this the phthalate syndrome. And so when the mother was exposed to DEHP or two other antiandrogenic phthalates, then the male offspring had these conditions which they named the phthalate syndrome. So the genitals were smaller, the testicles tended to be undescended, that's cryptorchidism, and then they had something called a shortened AGD. And this is where I've done a lot of work. And this is not something I had heard about, but it turns out that AGD is really, really important. It turns out that it's 50 to 100% longer in males than female mammals. And it turns out it's a really good marker of how much testosterone was present in, in utero at this critical time when the genitals were differentiating. So given this story, and a question posed to me by a colleague who's a chemist who said, Shauna, you should study phthalates. I did. And so how do you do this? Well, that was an animal study. I had to translate that into a human study. So I had to get a marker of phthalate exposure. Now we don't know how much phthalates we're exposed to. If you, I, I could ask you, or you could ask me, I, I don't know. Um, it's hidden, it's silent. And that's one of the dangers of these exposures. But it turns out that these chemicals are water soluble. And so you can measure them in the urine and those are called urinary phthalate metabolites. So fortunately from my study in four cities in which I had compared semen quality, I also had the male partners of the women we, uh, sorry, the female partners of the men we had studied in that. 
in that study. And so those females had given urine samples, which I stored for an unknown reason. And now I found out what the reason was. I could now measure phthalates in pregnancy. And then I could bring the children back and I could look for markers of the phthalate syndrome in those children. And so I designed a, a, um, an examination that would mimic the animal study, that would measure the antigenital distance, that would check for descent of the testes, the size of the penis, and, and that's what I did. And what I found was the phthalate syndrome. This was a pretty big and dramatic finding in 2005. And I replicated it 10 years later, because that's what you do in science, you replicate. And fortunately, in four different cities, different populations, I found this again. So what did I find? Prenatal phthalate exposure causes the phthalate syndrome in human males. I use that word cause because of the rodent data supporting it. Phthalates are anti-androgenic endocrine disruptors, and AGD is a marker of fetal androgen exposure. The work of Tyrone is very, very consistent with this. Um, I don't know if frogs have an anagenital distance or how it behaves. I only know mam about mammalian, but they certainly have um, other organs. And, and in particular, he asked, about sperm production, and so did we. So, so these males who have the short intergenital distance, does that matter? And that was the next question we asked. We found this, maybe it doesn't matter. They didn't look weird. You couldn't see a difference in, to the naked eye. You had to measure it. And so I couldn't ask that of our male children because they were just born or one year old. So I didn't have 20 years to answer this question. And so I designed another study. And in the next study, I recruited men in college. And this is the Rochester Young Men study. They were men in Rochester and they allowed us to measure their intergeneral distance and they gave us a semen sample. And this is what we found. The longer the AGD, the higher the sperm concentration. So we didn't have a direct link. We couldn't talk about semen quality in the boys born to our two studies, but if AGD is permanent, which rodent studies suggest it is, then we would expect those boys born with short AGD to grow up with a lower sperm count. And by the way, another study looked at fertility and showed that infertile males have a short intergenital distance, as do boys with genital abnormalities. So it turns, to be, it turns out to be a very important uh, measurement um, for looking at human toxicity, as well as rodent toxicity. Okay, so now I'd like to talk to you just briefly about timing. I want to tell you that the time at which the exposure occurs is extremely critical. Now for Tyrone's frogs, they're in that atrazine soup all the time. So I don't think, you know, time, timing is something that he can examine. And for humans, it's very difficult as well because we're in the endocrine disruptor soup all the time, aren't we? But in the animal studies, you can do this. You can tease out a particular time during which the intergenital distance is shortened if there is not enough testosterone. And that's called the male programming window. So this is when it's very essential that you have enough testosterone. Um, we also saw this in our studies. In our second study, we measured urine in three trimesters. So we had first, second, and third trimester urines. And as you can see here, this, what this shows you is when the bar is below zero, we see a significant reduction in male AGD, and it's only below zero in the first trimester. By the way, this is a smaller sample size because these were the mothers that we had three samples on. So it was only 169, so the bars are fairly long, but th this is a finding that is consistent with the finding that early pregnancy, first trimester 
is critical for this development. I want to also mention that changes that occur in utero are going to be permanent lifelong changes as opposed to changes that might occur. For example, if a man smokes when he's an adult, wasn't exposed prenatally, he can change that. He can stop smoking and his semen quality is, will get come back, come back, it'll get better. If he's exposed to a dangerous pesticide, he stops using it, his sperm count will come back. So timing is really, really important for these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Here's an example of, of father smoking around the time of conception, which by the way, matters as much as the mother smoking when she's pregnant. But when the son smokes, he has only about a half as much reduction in his sperm count. And as I said, it can be repaired by stopping smoking. The damage caused by the parental smoking is irreversible. I want to just mention that it's not just chemicals. I think you know that there are many other factors that affect our fertility, our reproductive health, and our sperm count. And just schematically here, this is a poor diet. Um, this is binge drinking, stress, heat, obesity, and lack of exercise. In addition to endocrine disrupting chemicals, all of these things matter. Okay, so what are some consequences of this exposure? In addition to being infertile, which many men are, or having reduced fertility and at least poor semen quality, we see that these men go on to have more disease and actually to die at a younger age. So it turns out that poor reproductive health is actually if you will, a sixth vital sign. It's telling us something about how our life is going to evolve in the future. And what you see here, it's a little complicated, but these were men who had their sperm count measured. All of those in this picture have a sperm count under 40, which is a cutoff for subfertility. So they had quite low sperm counts. And remember that number 40, because we're gonna come back to it. Um, and the lower they went, the higher their risk of death. And if they had born a child, they did better, but they also had risk of death increasing with a lower sperm count. So that's one really severe consequence in their analogs in women as well. There are also consequences for the entire planet. I won't dwell on this because Tyrone did this really beautifully, but um, if this is something that's, we're not alone. We're not alone in being threatened. We're not alone in being endangered. And I finally, one consequence I want to tell you is that we are passing these things on. And not only are we passing them on through our germline, our, our, through transgenerational effects, we're also passing these on because by not removing the exposure, we are successively exposing our children and our grandchildren. However, this picture tells you a good news story which comes from Pat Hunt's lab, which is that if the parent is, I'm sorry, I think I'm showing you the wrong slide here. This is the slide I wanted to show. <laughs> I was gonna skip that one. Um, so if the father is directly exposed, the son will be indirectly exposed, but then if we remove the chemicals, the grandson could be unexposed, the great grandson could be unexposed. And what Pat Hunt showed was in three generations, fertility would be restored. Now, Tyrone tells me that's not the case with his frogs. So I'm gonna put a little caution around this story, but it does suggest that we can, by removing exposure, improve our reproductive health. So how do we do that? I'll give you three steps to the roadmap. First of all, we have to test adequately. Right now, only 250 of the 60,000 chemicals that are out there in commerce have been directly tested by the EPA. We haven't scratched the surface. These chemicals have been grandfathered in, generally recognized as safe, and we don't know whether they're endocrine disruptors or whether they're dangerous. So we have to remove, identify and remove hormonally active chemicals from the environment. 
Moreover, we have to remove chemicals that cause harm at low doses and remove those that persist in the environment. And finally, remove those that have not been tested. We have to replace those. And Terry is an expert on this. Um, and you might ask him some questions about it and perhaps he'll answer. Um, we have to replace those with chemicals that are not endocrine disruptors, that are free of low dose adverse effects and are minimally pervasive in the environment. And here's a kicker. They should be shown to be safe before they're put into the market so that we are not the guinea pigs for this massive experiment. And then they must be regulated by assessing their low dose effects, their mixture effects. You know, we're exposed to these all at once in a big mixture. And we worry about mixtures of our drugs, but we don't worry much about the mixture of our chemical exposures. And they can be extreme when, they're, they, when we're exposed to many, many of these. And we must assess their environmental persistence and the risks in untested chemicals. So I'd like to just come back to the slide. This is my last slide. Um, I want to point out that by 2045, if we extended this curve, the median sperm count would be zero. Median is the center, 50% less for 50% greater. We can't go less than zero. So that means that half the population has no sperm. And a large part of the other 50% are going to be close to that and certainly below the 40% cutoff for subfertility. On the other hand, we can slow that down by, as Pat Hunt showed, removing chemicals that our successive generations are exposed to. And we have to start exposing our children and our grandchildren to these chemicals. And we have to start doing that right now. This is the main message of Countdown, which is published today. And um, thank you for your time and I'll take questions. Well, uh, Shana, uh, as always, that was an extraordinary presentation. Thank you very, very much indeed for it. Um, we do actually have some questions um, and I'll go through them quickly. Sometimes they've been answered by uh, Joe Reed at Phipps, but I'll go ahead and will the video be available? Yes, it will. It'll be available at the, at the link. Um, uh, Kelly Alder said, this is so disturbing. How do we move forward with stopping these and all other and all other pesticide use? What, what can we do uh, as next steps to get the ball rolling? To stop the usage. So I think Shana, you that was asked fairly early on, and I think you gave some level of answer. Um, and I wonder if either you or Tyrone would like to comment further on that. This is so disturbing. How do we move forward with stopping these and, uh, and all other pesticide use? So um, I'll just say that I'm probably not the best person to answer this question, but uh, with respect to pesticide use, um, I think that we have to have uh, pesticides that um, are safe. Um, if, if we feel that we have to use pesticides, let's figure out how to use safe pesticides. I prefer to recommend that people eat organic food, but this is an economic issue and not everyone can afford to do that. So to the extent that you can. And we showed this in our study that men who ate organic food had higher sperm counts. Um, mm. Eat organically when possible, avoid pesticides, and lobby for safer pesticides. Tyrone, you wanna to add to that? I, I think that lobbying and legislation is probably the, the fastest way to be effective. I've shown you that one, the EPA took 20 years to finally say, yeah, this stuff is bad. And, and then they saw in the same year, they reapproved atrazine for use. It's, they, it's, re it's banned now in Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii. Um, but other than that, there's no regulation. So um, lobbying and, and working with local government and as when you can, I always feel awkward saying this, but yeah, buying, you know, voting with your dollars, buying organic, avoiding, um, 
foods that, that heavily use pesticides. Um, and I feel awkward saying it because we're in California. My, my wife and I grow more vegetables than we can eat in our backyard year round, but you can't do that everywhere in the United States. Um, but where you can, I, I think supporting local farmers and eating locally is also important. And, and by the way, uh, th thank you, Tyron. I, I would like to comment that I noticed we have got some extraordinary scholars on this, uh, on this meeting. And so it's possible mm -hmm. that some of you others, other folks would like to weigh in as well. So I see Val Beasley there, Val from Penn State, um, also spoke two years ago and gave us a, a really a wonderful talk um, on the animal husbandry or the animal side of this. Uh, um, and uh, if you have anything to say, Val, at any stage, please weigh in. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, hey, Val. I retired from uh, Penn State. Uh, not long ago, last summer. Anyway, uh, but I'm still active and I'm concerned about these issues. And I agree with uh, Shauna that we need to test things before we get on, put them on the market and respect the precautionary principle. Um, in the meantime, we can do things like widening the buffers uh, to protect the streams, knowing more about the aquifers to protect the groundwater uh, cleaning up the water that's coming out of the reservoirs with activated carbon. Uh, there are interim strategies. Uh, there are new PFAS compounds that are replacing the more toxic ones, I guess. That's what I've read. I'd like to know what China thinks of, of those replacements. Uh, but I think public awareness and expectations um, are important. And uh, if we are, if we get about the business of trying to rehabilitate ecosystems uh, such as those that harbor uh, amphibian populations and see whether or not the frogs come back, see whether or not with less contamination, their breeding behaviors and fertility and productivity are increasing, uh, then maybe we can know more and prioritize, uh, if it's not coming back, uh, continue looking and, and refine the process. So we need to get active in trying to clean up this mess at the same time that we have stricter regulations as to what's continuing to be put out there and what new chemicals are allowed. Thank, thank you, Val. And I also notice uh, my good friend Martin Wagner uh, from Trondheim, yeah. from University of Norway on, on the call. And Martin is similarly somebody always to listen to in this area. Martin, do you have anything you'd like to say? Harry, you're catching me a bit unprepared. <laughs> um, but anyway, happy to comment. Well, I can just like second everything um, that's been said before. But I think we re really need to fundamentally rethink like the system by which we design chemicals, really. We talked a lot about regulation and we heard it's painfully slow, really. And that's our experience, not only in the US, but also in Europe when it comes to endocrine disrupting compounds. So I think we really need to fundamentally change the way we make those chemicals really. During the design process, we need to have a collaboration with toxicologists, epidemiologists, public health people to make sure we are designing all those compounds in a way that they are safe in the best way they can be safe. Absolute safe, safety is nothing that we will ever be achieving, but we should optimize the safety of the compounds that we're using. And frustratingly, I don't see any initiative with that regard, mainly because it's just very costly for the corporations that are doing this. And there is not enough public pressure to do it and not enough incentive really to do it. But I think like in the longer run, of course, we need to ban like the bad actors here in the first place, but then we really need to redesign the whole chemical um, enterprise. And that's, that's the challenge that we, we must talk about. Um, can I just hop in and ask Martin a question? <laughs> because okay. he's, the, he's the leading expert probably in the world on um, as endocrine disrupting chemicals in um, our drinking water uh, our, our food containers. Could you just say a word about, you know, those risks? Because I think you're, you're the person to talk about that. Yeah, right. So, I mean, most of the research that we've been recently doing is looking at plastic chemicals apart from the usual suspects, so apart from phthalates um, and bisphenols. 
Uh, and what we find is like a, tra a tremendous complexity of compounds used in everyday plastic uh, products and, and food packaging, but also in other plastic products. So um, we can find between hundreds to ten thousands of different chemicals used in food containers. Uh, most of them remain unknown. But what we're seeing when we do like cell culture work is that some of those um, induce anti-androgenic effects indeed. Uh, and, and it's not the usual suspects, right? So, I mean, corporations have been quite good in removing BPA from their products and they have been quite good in uh, replacing phthalates, but we're talking about thousands of compounds in, in, in all the plastic items that we're using on a daily basis. They're unknown, they remain untested, but at least in cell cultures, we see that they're endocrine disrupting. So I think that's definitely something that, that we need to look into. And then the challenge is really, what do you do about those thousands of compounds? And I think the first step should be that we talk to the polymer chemists, how we can make plastic chemically more simple. Why do they need to contain 1000 compounds? So why can't we make plastic products that just contain the compounds that we have looked at before, that we have tested and that we believe are safe? So I think there's really a lot to, that needs to be done there. So, so perhaps I, I'll make a comment here. Um, uh, so I laid out a principle reason, recently. It's based on mechanistic chemistry. You, you really cannot ever prove that a chemical is safe. That's an extraordinary statement, I know, but you really can't. What you can always do is prove it's not safe. Um, and so the business of putting out a commercial uh, chemical that is safe is really about assembling a weight of evidence case that it doesn't have bad effects. And you might be five years or so into the commercialization and suddenly somebody does something and shows uh, <coughs> that you hadn't tried and shows a bad effect and suddenly that chemical you thought was sustainable isn't sustainable. Um, the company that we started at Carnegie Mellon called Sudoc um, is really based on this kind of analysis up front where you're looking uh, very closely at, at uh, the effects before you commercialize. Now, when you ask what kind of effects do we have to worry about? Honestly, if a chemical is gonna kill you quickly, we're gonna find it. That's not a problem, really. I mean, it's a problem if you get exposed, but we're going to find it. It's the low dose for mammals, because that's how we test, we give them a dose, or the low concentration, as in the aquatic organisms, fish and Tyrone's uh, amphibians, because that's how we, we measure. We measure the concentration in the water rather than in, in the animal typically. It's low dose and low concentration adverse effects. And when we're talking low, it's really low. Parts per trillion to low parts per billion. So ultra low doses that produce these effects in chemicals that we call micro pollutants typically have less than two, two parts per billion of the offending compound. We've got to catch those. We know we have hundreds of them. Some of them are everyday, everywhere chemicals. Um, we're not gonna solve this problem. There's, there's gonna be nowhere, no one left to look at this problem if you, if you look at what Shana's data tells you. The children that were half, the, 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 the males of reproductive age that it, where half are go, going to have sperm count zero or and the other half hovering somewhat curiously above it are already being born. We don't really have any window of safety here. Um, and so the underlying philosophy or the underlying error is that you can make a chemical for a particular purpose that has high technical and cost performances and assume you can throw it out there and it's going to be just a very good little chemical and go and do what you want to do it to do and nothing else. What we've learned through our insight into endocrine disruption is that that is hopelessly naive. It's not like that at all. And if we don't wake up like yesterday, uh, we're not, we're, there's going to be no one here to, uh, to have the arguments that we're having today. Um, so that. I, I don't want to finish at that point, but I did want to make it. Does anybody <laughs> else have additional questions? If we look down, we have the so disturbing. We then have another comment. Disgusting money reigns supreme over human health. 
truly another pandemic at hand. Um, anybody want to comment on disgusting money? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so look, there, there are four, a chemical compound has made it into commerce almost up to now based on two performances. It will have high technical performance and it will have high cost performance. It does something people want and you can make money. Unfortunately for sustainability, there are three other performances that are critical, the health performance, the environmental performance and the fairness performance. Mm. And we very quickly <laughs> have to bring those into the value proposition, certainly for new chemicals and start ejecting the ones that don't have high performances in those areas. Thank you for speaking, Tyrone. Uh, who would you empower to, re te to test, recall, and ban? Wow, what a great question. FDA does not have authority or financial support to start this process. Absolutely right. Um, what's happening is the European Union uh, on this October 14 announced a new chemical, uh, chemical strategy. <coughs> that it will test for endocrine disruption. Uh, it, and we really, really wish them the best and, and hope that, um, that that effort takes off and becomes very powerful and, and that the European will, Europeans will lead the world in doing the kind of testing that has to be done. Um, so give all the sport you can to that one. That's really, um, really important. Thank you both for an amazing talk, Dr. Hayes. You alluded to how atrazine levels in certain bodies of water can disproportionately affect low-income individuals living nearby. Would you mind talking more about environmental racism and injustice as it relates to atrazine? Tyra? Oh, you're muted, Tyra. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom. Uh, I, I think there's several examples that relate to atrazine, but I think are probably more generally true. And that's starting at the point of production. Atrazine is produced in a plant in San Gabriel, Louisiana. It's a community that's 80% black, low income um, community. And in their factory, there's an 8.4 fold increase in prostate cancer. And the men who work in the room bagging the atrazine. And again, it's in a community that's predominantly black and it's surrounded by the way, um, Syngenta, Navarta Syngenta aren't the only ones that are there. They're all refineries and a number of other um, chemically producing plants in the area. The second um, is agricultural workers. So the levels of, I mean, as Sean has already shown, um, levels of atrazine in men who live in Columbia, Missouri can have a physiological and impact on their, on their reproduction. Um, but other work has shown that men who work in the fields in California have urine levels that are 24,000 times higher than what was measured in that. They have levels of 24, the men who apply the atrazine have levels 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. And, and not much is known about their reproductive health at all. So, so those are just two examples, um, but I think it's, it's, it's very common knowledge that if you are an immigrant or low income um, or an ethnic minority, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. Um, I think a perfect example is cancer where black people are more likely to get 11 out of the 13 top cancers in the country um, and more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. And my colleagues who are experts in cancer say that less than 30% of cancer is genetic. It's an environmental disease, it's a disease of exposure. And so what that means is that when your doctor tells you you're more likely to get for example, breast cancer, if your sister, your aunt, your mother, or somebody in your family has had it, they're not telling you that you, have, that you have bad genes, they're telling you that you've been exposed to the same environmental hazards as the rest of your family typically. Um, and what our studies are showing in frogs is that even if you move away, one, not only are, are you sometimes carrying the contaminants in your body, but also we're showing long-term multi-generational effects that actually the sensitivity to some of these chemicals actually increase with each generation of exposure, at least in frogs. So. Well, continuing with other great scholars, um, I'd like to ask my colleague, Brian Sullivan, um, who is a truly outstanding uh, environmental chemist, if um, 
if he would like to weigh in at this point on anything that he's heard today. Um, I mean, I really appreciate all the questions that are I've seen being asked. I think some very good ideas have been raised. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from the example that Europe is setting. Europe is um, ahead, uh, well ahead of the U.S. in terms of chemical re regulations, and they just went through a, a major new advance just last year. They are regarding chemicals as classes instead of as individuals. Um, Carla Ng, who is also on the call, has um, played an important role in um, uh, advancing the idea of thinking about PFAS, the perfluorinated chemicals that I started working on 20 years ago um, as a class instead of individuals, um, because otherwise companies can play switcheroo and say, well, we changed this one little bit of the molecule, so it's a different chemical, but its properties are, are very similar um, I don't understand the regulatory space as well. I saw a comment, you know, that FDA doesn't have the authority to regulate. And my question would be, I mean, if the FDA doesn't have the authority to regulate, who does? And if no one does, then that seems to be the major, the major problem. Um, I also, um, I don't agree that, you know, chemicals are always being made and used to fill a need. I think there's a lot of unnecessary use of chemicals. Like we don't need we don't need perfluorinated chemicals in toilet bowl cleaner or windshield wiper fluid or in um, uh, food wrapping, for example, um, where it's there so that the paper doesn't um, absorb the grease um, and you see how greasy the sandwich or whatever you're about to eat is. Those are unnecessary uses of dangerous, immortal, <laughs> forever chemicals. So I don't know if I'm giving a clear answer other than that, I think a, uh, a lot of this discussion is very healthy and, and headed in the right direction. And I really appreciate um, the efforts of Tyrone and Shauna. And I think, you know, Shauna's book um, will do a lot of good to raise the attention and, and put it, this critical information in a very digestible form for the public, which is, you know, so, so important for getting the answer out there. And, and there are solutions, right? We, we, there are alternatives to a lot of these chemicals. There are ways to test for these effects. And there's also what Terry and I work on together. Um, there are also ways to safely remove these chemicals from water, for example. And thank you, thank you very much. And you know, I'm gonna do something unusual. Normally, um, when you invite people to speak of a situation, like it's normally this, the um, established um, scientists, but, but you know, the young people, uh, the most important, really, uh, people on this call. This, this is a, a really incredible uh, set of problems that um, are going to be very difficult to deal with that we, through our collective inaction and uh, arguably irresponsibility, have, have really thrown into your court. Um, and we have one uh, person who has been remarkably brave in trying to deal with these issues. And in actual fact, it's, it's with phthalates, um, which we've heard from Dr. Swan, uh, these powerful anti-androgens. So I'd like to call on William Fahey, um, who is uh, about to graduate uh, from Carnegie Mellon, and ask William to maybe tell people about the heroic, I'll say that it was heroic, the efforts that he made to try to get phthalates. <laughs> out of mac macaroni and cheese uh, from, I won't mention the name, but a local mega company. Thank you. Are you there, William? Yeah, sure. I, I can talk a little bit about that. I mean, uh, it was uh, mostly related to an effort, a petition effort by um, a group of, of NGOs uh, to, to a company uh, to remove uh, sources of phthalates in their in their production lines, and uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Swan, you you discussed a lot of the potential uh, sources there, and so um, it it was of course uh, not not particularly successful. Uh, the, the the companies are not willing to change very easily or quickly. Although I did notice that there's been some progress in some of the more progressive uh, companies in the area, so. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to see all of this research right now. I'm, uh, interested in working in this field when I graduate, uh, in, in, in grad school, but, um, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to talk. 
I just wanted to interrupt for a second and, and, and say, I'm sorry, but I have to leave. I have a, actually a TV uh, interview that I have to go to. And I see that Tyrone has a class to teach. So um, I, I encourage you to go on speaking, but unfortunately I'm gonna have to leave the discussion. Well, thank, you. thank, thank you so much, Shana. And um, I think based on that, uh, uh, that we will call the meeting to an end. I'm sorry, we didn't get through all the questions. Thank you both. Thank you, Shana. Thank, thank you, you Tyrone, for, for absolutely brilliant talks. And thank you to everybody for attending. Bye.